not want to follow that presentation. <laughs> I even, uh, I had to leave a few minutes early in order to mic up and I didn't want to leave. It was so good. I unfortunately don't have any magic skills, so there won't be any cards or props, but I will be talking about Sherlock Holmes, who is a magician of sort himself when it comes to deduction and when it comes to understanding the human mind. So when you think about psychology, Sherlock Holmes might not be the first mentor that comes to mind. It might be, oh, let's see. It might be better to actually be able to make this thing work. Down. Do a little dance with the with the pointer. It's really not working. Hmm. We have a technical issue. The pointer is really not working. I mean, I can do the presentation without the PowerPoint, but I have cool pictures and I want to share them with you. Yep. Still not working. Huh. Is there another uh, is there another slide we can get to? Well, you guys should have the whole file. Okay, I see. All right. <laughs> You should, yes. <laughs> the magic trick to end all magic tricks. He wanted, he wanted to be the last impression, and so he didn't want me to give my talk. And this was the result. I knew he'd sabotage me somehow. And I was just so nice to him. I told him how wonderful his presentation was. There we go. Wonderful. I pleaded with him. He undid it. <laughs> well, the magic has gone. So now we can see Mr. Sigmund Freud, who seems to be a much more suitable choice for a psychology mentor, for someone to teach us about the human mind. Or maybe William James, the father of cognitive psychology, who is credited with really setting the foundations for what we think of as the study of the human mind in the 20th century and the 21st century. Or maybe B.F. Skinner, who was the father of behaviorism, or the idea that everything was really the result of our environment and that we didn't really need to understand the mind at all. But when it came down to it, I chose to go in a different direction. <laughs> or perhaps, Whatever it was, I realized when I went back to reread the stories of my childhood that Sherlock Holmes served as a near ideal guide to the human mind, how we can use our mind to think better than we do naturally. And so today I want to talk about what Sherlock Holmes can teach us about thought, what he can teach us about psychology, what he can teach us about maximizing our thinking and our ability to make the most of our cognitive abilities. So there are a few points I'm going to make today. The magic number 17, your mind attic that needs to be cleaned and stocked regularly, the fact that pipe smoking is in fact good for you, the fact that you should never forget dogs that don't bark, and finally, overconfidence will kill you, but curiosity won't, so you're not a cat. The magic number 17. So when I was little, my dad used to read us Sherlock Holmes stories before bed. He sat in front of the fire. He even smoked a pipe. So it was all very atmospheric, very majestic. And there's one scene that really stuck with me throughout my entire life. It was something that really affected me as a child. And it's this exchange that Holmes and Watson have in A Scandal in Bohemia. Holmes asks Watson how many steps lead up to 221B Baker Street, the place where they live. And Watson has no idea. He says, I don't know. And Holmes says, well, that's the difference between us. You only see, I both see and observe. And this was just mind boggling to my eight-year-old self. I thought, oh my god, I don't know how many steps lead anywhere. So frantically, I started counting steps. 
So first I counted how many steps went from the first floor to the second floor and I tried to memorize that number. Then I tried to count how many steps led up to our front door. I tried to memorize that. I tried to keep all of these in mind and wherever I went, I'd count steps and then I'd keep them in mind, 23, 23, 23, 23. And then I'd forget them and I was miserable. Um, I kind of missed the broader point of this, which is really the difference between seeing and observing or the difference between mindlessness and how we normally go through life, how a Watson will go through life, and mindfulness, which is that observation, that deep presence of thought that Sherlock Holmes embodies. So mindfulness is not something that we normally associate with the present day. Many more of us are like this gentleman, the biker. He's riding his bike. He's also talking on his cell phone. God forbid if a car is going to come to the intersection right now, because if he's actually involved in talking on the phone, he's not going to see it. And if he is actually involved in riding the bike, yes, he won't be hit by the car, but poor person to whom he's talking on the phone because he's not gonna be listening to the conversation. Because the thing about our minds is they can't do two things at once. Multitasking is a myth, it doesn't exist. We our brains are not capable of multitasking. So instead, when we think we're multitasking, when we, like this gentleman, think that we're being so productive because we're talking on the phone, we're riding our bikes, we're getting so much done, we're really doing neither of those things. We're switching our attention incredibly rapidly between the two things that we're doing or the multiple things that we're doing, and we're not devoting as much of our attention as we need to any one thing. And multitasking is anathema to mindfulness, to the type of deep observation that Holmes embodies. We can't multitask and be mindful of our environment. Unfortunately, the modern world makes this incredibly difficult because we are always connected. You know, how many of you have your cell phones out right now? How many of you have your computers out right now? How many of you are doing something other than listening to me? You might be tweeting, which we encourage here, but which also means that you're not paying as much attention to what I'm saying because you're trying to keep in mind my words long enough to have a pithy statement of 140 characters, 120 <laughs> characters, however many it is, and you wanna sound smart, you wanna sound good, and then you say, oh gosh, the hashtag, it makes me go over, now what do I take out? So all these things are going through your mind and you're not paying attention to the presentation. And kids, younger and younger, are learning to do this every single day. What Holmes teaches us is that instead, we need to learn to quiet our minds, to disconnect, to turn off Twitter, to put away our cell phones, to put away our computers, and to take a moment to be quiet, to be alone with our thoughts, to be, in other words, mindful. So I'm going to require a little bit of audience participation now. I want you all to, for a moment, stop whatever you're doing, unless it's listening to me, and close your eyes. I can't see you, so I'm going to assume that your eyes are closed. Now, I want you to focus on your breath. So just clear your mind and focus on the ins and outs of your breath. And if any distracting thoughts come into your mind, say, hi, distracting thought, please go away and dismiss it and continue to focus on your breath. All right, you can open your eyes. So that was just 20 seconds, but I'm sure it probably felt like longer because we're really out of the habit of doing that. We never take the time to just sit quietly without doing anything and to just focus on being us, to be alone with our thoughts, to not be doing something because there's always something that we can be doing. And yet a lot of research has shown that doing that for as little as 10 minutes a day, and what you just did was a classical exercise in mindfulness meditation, as little as 10 minutes a day, and your brains start looking like those of experienced meditators. So what does that mean? That means you're more creative. So what you're doing is strengthening your default network, which is the network of the brain, which is active when we're in our so-called resting state. And this enables us to be more creative problem solvers. So people who practice mindfulness meditation are able to solve problems faster and more difficult problems than those who don't. It also means you're happier because these, this has also been associated with more positive and approach-oriented emotional states. You're also just cognitively sharper. So you're able to take information and see the environment in a way that people 
who don't have that ability to concentrate have, because what you're doing in essence is strengthening your concentration ability. You're strengthening your ability to pay attention for longer and longer periods of time so that you can be as observant as Holmes, and it starts being less and less effortful. And finally, you're just more observant. That's exactly what Holmes is saying. You will know how many steps lead up to 221B Baker Street, and you won't have to do anything about it. And this leads directly to what Holmes would call an organized mind attic. This metaphor comes directly from his words to Watson, where he says that there are really two types of mind attic. There's the fool's mind attic, and if you picture, picture just a regular attic, and what do you normally do? You can say, oh, I have all the space in the world. I'm just going to put, start putting up stuff. So you go to a junk sale, you go to a flea market, you go to somewhere important, and you, put, you start putting things up in your attic. And before you know it, it's a jumble because you're just throwing any which thing up there and you're not really paying attention to what's going up there. And you've run out of space. And what's more, you don't even remember what you've put up there because you can't find it. It's disorganized. It's a jumble. That's your fool's mind attic. Then there's a Sherlock Holmes mind attic. Holmes employs his mindfulness to what he remembers, to his memory, to what gets stored in that mind attic to begin with. So first he says, is this important enough? Do I need to remember it? If it passes that test, he will store it, but he won't just throw it up there. He'll make sure that it's stored in an organized fashion so that he's actually able to access it when and where he needs to. Because the thing about memory is we can only know what we remember at any given moment. If we can't remember it when we need it, we might as well not know it because it's not going to be helpful to us. So we don't just need to store it, we need to be able to access it. So if you continue thinking of this attic space, think of neat boxes with labels on them. Think of files in those boxes also with labels. The more points of encoding you have for any memory, the more likely you are to remember them, especially if you can tie it to emotion, to something that's already in your mind attic, to existing experience, you're much more likely to be able to recall it, to retrieve it at that important moment. We're going to do a short exercise where I'm going to read something that's taken from a very classic study in psychology, which illustrates that our mind addicts are really not always optimal. So we have a lot of junk up there, which causes us to decide in ways that might not necessarily be right. So which option is more likely? Bill is 34 years old. He's intelligent, but unimaginative, compulsive, and generally lifeless. In school, he was strong in mathematics, but weak in social studies and humanities. Bill plays jazz for a hobby. Does that sound like Bill? What about Bill being an accountant who plays jazz for a hobby? Now we're going to meet Linda. She's 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. She's a bank teller. She's a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Now, many of you have probably seen this before because it's taken verbatim from Daniel Kahneman's classic study of this exact effect, which is called the conjunction fallacy. Most people choose option B in every case because it simply seems more compelling because the description activates all sorts of stereotypes which make option B seem like the more likely candidate because we can see Bill as an accountant. We can see Linda as someone who's active in the feminist movement. And so because of that, we assume that that goes for the whole statement. And yet the reason it's a fallacy is they can't possibly be more true than statement one because they all contain statement one. And yet time and time again, Kahneman found that the vast majority of people would choose option two, even when this was the only option that was presented, these two choices. Originally he had you know, nine, 10, I don't remember how many. So he thought, well, maybe people are just not getting it. They got it, it just didn't matter. <laughs> because it still, you know, it just still seemed more likely. So we're gonna do, this is my, uh, this is my attempt at my own magic trick. So I want everyone to think of a number between 0 and 10. It can't be 0, so between 1 and 10, I guess. OK? Does everyone have a number? I'm going to require a little bit of mental math, but don't worry, it's not hard. Multiply the number that you have by 9. 
all, all set, do you have your new number? If it's two digits, please add the two digits together. Everyone have their new number? Subtract five from it. Now imagine that your new number is a letter of the alphabet. So if you have one, it would be A. If you have two, it would be B, et cetera, okay? Think of a country that begins with that letter. Do you have your country? Now think of the second letter of that country. And think of an animal that begins with that letter. What color is your animal? <laughs> so this is my own attempt at my magic trick which shows really this is exactly what Sherlock Holmes does. On a day-to-day -day basis, he seems like he's reading your mind, but really he just understands the mind attic incredibly well. He understands what your brain is going to do before you do, and he's able to take advantage of that in order to create these spectacular effects. I'm actually going to explain to you exactly how I did this so that you're no longer going to be mystified. It's not going to be nearly as exciting, but it's the exact same thing that Sherlock Holmes does. So first, the numbers I gave you were rigged, because at the moment I had you multiply by nine, what do we know about numbers that are multiplied by nine? The sum of their digits are going to equal nine. I knew everyone, unless you screwed up your math, which wasn't my fault, would end up with four at the end. And the reason that this was chosen is specifically because there aren't that many countries that start with D. And we know that the way the mind works, something called the availability heuristic, you're going to take the most available country, the first thing that comes to mind. So chances are, maybe some of you chose the Dominican Republic, but for most people, it would be Denmark. And E is also a letter that there aren't very many animals that you think of. And here we have the representativeness heuristic. You're probably going to choose elephant, not eel, because elephant is something that's more of an animal. So the way that this is, the way that this is, maybe someone did have an eel, but it's also gray, so there are no gray eels in Denmark would also work. <laughs> so this is, these are kinds of mental shortcuts that we use all the time. And what someone like Sherlock Holmes knows how to do is take advantage of these. And what we can learn from it is to know that our minds think this way. And so we can't help it, we can't stop them from thinking that way, but we can be more aware of it in times when it actually matters. It doesn't matter that I'm able to guess that you're thinking about gray elephants in Denmark, but it may matter in certain other situations where you want to control that immediate jump. So you should be aware, say, okay, my brain normally does this. How can I keep that in mind and tell it to do something else if I want it to? Because really, the entire time, that really is all Sherlock Holmes is doing. But the brain attic is really different today from the times of Sherlock Holmes. And this is something called the Google effect. Last year, a group of psychologists at Columbia University decided to see, does Google actually affect the way that we think and the way that we remember? So now we can look anything up in a second. Does this make our memories worse? So they took, they took a number of students and they asked them to remember certain information. Some of the students knew that they'd be able to have that information available later, that they'd be able to search for it. Other students did not, they were just told to memorize it. The researchers found two things. First, they found that the people who thought that they would have access to the information didn't remember it nearly as well. Their memories were much, much worse. Pretty, pretty uh, predictable. But the second thing is kind of interesting. It's not that these people didn't remember anything. It's that they didn't remember the information. They remembered something else instead. They remembered how to access it. So they remembered exactly where it was and how to get there. They remembered the access pathway which if you think about it is incredibly smart of your brain. It thinks, okay, I don't need this in my attic because I'm going to be able to find it later on. And so I, why should I devote my precious mental real estate to something that I can easily find? And so instead of remembering it, I'm just going to remember how to find it. And this is something that we can really take advantage of if we know that that's the way that our memory is going to work. So we can say, okay, for all of the unimportant things, I can relegate them to this kind of Google effect, this virtual storage, but you also have to be aware that your mind might do this even when you don't want it to because it's realizing that it can find it. So an awareness 
of, of this tendency will make your memory better as well because you can say, wait, mind, no, I actually want to remember this. So I don't just want to remember where to find this. I want this to be stored in my attic. This is not an endorsement of smoking per se, although nicotine has been tied to creativity. Just, just throwing that out there. But Sherlock Holmes is really known for smoking his pipe. And to him, the pipe is really a means to an end. Sure, he enjoys it, but do you notice when he smokes it? It's always when he's thinking and when he has a case that he needs to solve. He never jumps into the case right away. So in the adventure of the Red-Headed League, there's a client who comes to Sherlock Holmes. He has this brilliant flaming red hair and he says, Holmes, I think something's wrong. I got hired by this employer just for the color of my hair and I don't do anything. I just get paid to sit in a room all day and have red hair. Um, I think something's fishy. And Holmes says, yes, you're, you're probably right. So the client says, come on, I want to show you where I work. I want you to introduce you to all these people. And Holmes says, no, no, go away. I'll get to you when I'm ready. So he leaves. Watson says, well, Holmes, what are we going to do? You know, he's jumping from excitement saying, we need to go do something. And Holmes says, Watson, calm down. We're not going to do anything. I'm going to sit in my armchair and I'm going to smoke a pipe. This is quite the three pipe problem. And that's exactly what he does. He sits down, he smokes three pipes, and at the end of the third pipe, he knows the solution to the case. And yes, we might have a little bit of a fictional effect here. He didn't necessarily need to come up with a solution. But what he's showing is the importance of distance, of taking a step back, of learning how to take a moment to think and to reflect instead of just jumping into a problem right away. We don't do this nearly often enough because we think that it's a waste of time. We think that right away we need to be doing something. We're like Watson, what are we going to do? What am I gonna do about it? Who am I gonna talk to? What's my plan of action? No, take a step back, relax. That's the time that you need to let your mind really just soak it all in and see things from different perspectives. And so then you might be able to think of something that you would never have thought of had you just started working right away. I'm gonna show you a series of pictures that show from a perceptual point of view exactly what I mean. Because if you look at these pictures just for a second, you're not going to get the full effect and you're going to miss the greater part of the picture. It would be just like jumping in without taking the time to smoke a pipe. <coughs> so what do you see here? Is it use or is it death? A skull, well do you see the two people as well? So there are two but you can't see both at once. What about here? The Mexicans, the old people, once again, can't see both at once. And how many Don Quixotes do you see? Do you see his windmills? <laughs> Maybe you see Sancho as well. Dali loved these. This is one of Dali's most famous. And here, another Dali, a beautiful landscape, or is it an eerie face? And because Dali loved these effects so much, from a modern artist, we have a tribute to Dali himself. Or is it someone just having breakfast, reading a book? Or one of our old friends from psychology, Mr. Sigmund Freud, in profile. And then some of the most famous illusions that are used in psychology. The young woman in death. The young woman and the old woman, perhaps one of the most famous of these after all. So how many people see the young woman first? And how many see the old woman? Yeah, it's interesting. There are very, very predictable differences um, in this. Normally people see one or the other first and some people can't see it's really hard for them to see the other one. And this can shift with age. So maybe you see the young woman when you're younger and you see the old woman when you're older. And finally, the duck rabbit. Who sees a duck first? Who sees a rabbit? It's about half and half with this one. But the point of all of these is you would never see the full picture if you just looked at it and walked away. And the way that you can really relate this to creative thinking is that you always need to take the time to look 
take the time to look at it from different perspectives and realize that you can't see both at once. You have to take a step back. There's no way that your mind can process everything all at once. And this is what is really essential to creative thinking. And Holmes is an incredibly creative thinker. There are things we can do to facilitate this. So you can see Holmes often just sits in his armchair and he might be smoking his pipe, he might not be, but this is kind of what he does. For some of us that might not be enough because we're just not used to it. This is basically him doing the kind of mindfulness exercise that we did before. But for those of us who need other stimuli, nature has been shown to facilitate creativity. So in some studies, people who take a 30 minute walk are able to solve problems that they couldn't solve before the walk. And then if you have two groups of people, one who takes a walk in nature and another group that doesn't, the ones who took the walk solve the same problems much faster and are able to solve problems that the ones who didn't take that nature walk or who took an, a walk in an urban environment, because it does have to be a natural environment, can't solve. And if you don't have time to take a walk, there's even a study that shows that having a screensaver of nature and looking at those shots on your screen can have the same kind of cognitive uptick and creative problem solving. So you can't say, I don't have time. Everyone has time to switch their screensaver to these natural shot, uh, scenes. No one knows why this is the case. We don't actually know the mechanism behind this, but we do know that it works and it works predictably and it works in a very kind of strong fashion. These effects are not weak. Taking walks, doing unrelated things, taking showers, going to sleep, all of these changes of activity. Holmes plays the violin, he goes to the opera. Basically, learning to waste time, to realize that this is not time wasting, that you're actually allowing your subconscious mind to continue working on the problem, that you're being much more efficient and you're making your mind much more efficient in the long run by not being a workaholic, by not eating lunch in front of your desk, by learning to take that hour to take a walk, to do something else, listen to music, whatever it is, but something that is not continuing to do the exact same thing. Mental breaks can really not be underestimated. And finally, this is just kind of one of those cute results that makes me, makes me smile every time. Outside cues also really help prime our mindset. And so in this particular study, you see people in white coats because people who wore white coats became be better able to solve problems. So somehow, the very fact of putting on that coat made them think of doctors, of researchers, of scientists, of people who were really good problem solvers, and lo and behold, they became better able to solve problems themselves. And these types of cues work on us all the time because our mindset really can matter for what and how we're able to solve problems and how, quote unquote, smart we end up being. And finally, we have the dogs that don't bark. Now, you heard something about this in uh, the prior presentation, which is the importance of absent information. This comes from Silver Blaze, one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, where this horse goes missing and Holmes solves the problem, but he doesn't tell the investigator yet. And so the inspector asks him, is there anything to which you wish to draw my attention? And Holmes says, why yes, as a matter of fact, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, to which the inspector says, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes answers, that is a curious incident. When he means that absent information, we tend not to look at it at all, but it's just as important as present information, sometimes more so. In this particular case, it made him realize that the dog must have known the thief, otherwise the dog would have barked. So it's something that is incredibly telling and something that most people ignore. So here, I'm gonna show you two phones, phone A and phone B. Take a look and tell me which one you'd rather buy. I'll give you a second. Who wants phone A? Who wants phone B? All right, I'm gonna show you a second slide. I'm not gonna change any information. I'm just gonna add one line. What about now, who wants phone A? <laughs> who wants phone B? Still have some takers for phone B. I'm gonna do the exact same thing, not changing anything but adding one line. <laughs> now who wants phone B? This is called omission neglect. It's something that marketers love, 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 love. We don't ask for the information that's missing, we just look at the information that's present. That's how we make decisions and that's really not the right way to do it. We always need to challenge our mind to keep looking at different perspectives and to keep realizing that absent information is just as telling as present information, and we need to keep searching, and we can't just come to a decision right away. We need to keep asking for more. 
And finally, the overconfident fool versus the curious learner. One of the things that we get, the more, the more expert we become, the smarter we become, the more we know, the more likely we are to be overconfident and to stop learning. And that's something that we should really never allow ourselves to do. Sherlock Holmes takes on cases even in retirement. He never actually retires. That's one of the reasons he stays Sherlock Holmes. And recent work suggests that we can keep learning really into old age and learn in very profound ways. In one study, people who learned how to juggle showed incredible brain changes just within a month. And then when they stopped training for six months, lo and behold, their brains went back to baseline. It's as if they had never learned to juggle at all. So their brains kept learning even when they weren't learning. They, it was really a use it or lose it type of proposition. In another study, older adults were able to learn Chinese. And within eight months of immersive Chinese learning, they became, their brains started resembling those of lifelong bilinguals, even though language learning is something that has always been associated with a critical period. Once again, it's never too late to learn, and our brains really are always taking cues from us. And so what we can really do is just remain curious, remain that curious child for whom learning is fun, for whom it's a game. And I'd like to leave you with the famous words of Sherlock Holmes, the game is afoot. To him, what he did was always fun. It was always interesting. It was always exciting. And so he was always able to stay curious. And if that's one thing that you take from Sherlock Holmes, it's that, remain engaged and always think of everything as a game. So whichever Holmes you espouse, I hope you agree with me that he's a great guide to the human mind. Thank you.